Hi, I'm Valerie Schutte, and I'm going to talk to you about Mary Tudor and her five stepmothers. By the age of 27, Mary Tudor, the eldest daughter of King Henry VIII, had five stepmothers. Her father had famously separated from her mother, Catherine of Aragon, leaving Mary the only living child of their union, and he later remarried five more times. And although Mary always remained close with her mother, the same cannot always be said for her relationships with the stepmothers who followed. Anne Boleyn, the first to follow Catherine of Aragon in becoming Henry VIII's queen, was by many accounts Mary's least favorite stepmother. And these two shared the worst relationship. By 1527, and possibly even earlier, the event that would have the most significant impact on Mary's life had already been set in motion. When it became clear that Henry VIII wanted to annul his marriage to Catherine because she had not borne him any living sons. Anne Boleyn, a lady-in-waiting to the queen and mistress to the king, was ready to fulfill this duty, but only as Henry's wife. Mary became a pawn in the bitter battle as Catherine appealed to Henry to stay in their marriage as they shared so sweet a princess for their daughter. Henry refused Catherine and moved forward with his annulment on the basis that Catherine had previously been married to his older brother, Arthur, and their subsequent union was incestuous. In late 1531, Henry forbade Catherine to see her daughter and Mary was increasingly kept from court. Henry and a pregnant Anne Boleyn married on 25 January, 1533, and five months afterwards, Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine was declared invalid by Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mary was deemed illegitimate and stripped of her succession rights, and her mother was forbidden to see her. The fall from grace and title was complete. Mary became a lady rather than a princess, and she and her father were frequently separated, often at the insistence of Anne, creating both a physical and familial rift between father and daughter. Henry and Anne's daughter Elizabeth was born on 7 September 1533, a development that did not make Mary's relationship with Anne any less hostile. Mary was now required to acknowledge Elizabeth as a legitimate princess and Henry's heir, something she would not do. As a result, Mary was placed in Elizabeth's household under the watchful eye of Anne's aunt and uncle, Sir John and Lady Anne Shelton. Even so, Anne frequently complained that Mary was not being surveyed close enough. On one visit to Elizabeth in March 1534, Anne demanded that Mary come see her and honor her as queen, saying it would be a means of reconciliation with the king and she would intercede with him for her. Mary agreed to see Anne, but refused to acknowledge any queen other than her mother. This enraged Anne, who swore that she would bring down the pride of this unbridled Spanish blood. On 24 March, 1534, Pope Clement VII passed final sentence on the marriage of Henry and Catherine, declaring it was valid and canonical. One week later, the act of succession received royal assent, thereby rejecting the Pope's ruling. Archbishop of Canterbury Thomas Cranmer decreed Henry and Anne's marriage valid, and the succession was transferred to Henry's heirs by Anne Boleyn. Mary was both bastardized and barred from the succession. Commissioners were sent to Catherine to notify her of the succession changes. Yet Catherine reiterated that Mary was the king's true begotten child. And as God had given her unto the king as his daughter, to do with her as shall stand with his pleasure, trusting God that she will prove an honest woman. Both Catherine and Mary refused to sign the oath of succession, acknowledging the legitimacy of Princess Elizabeth. Mary frequently suffered bouts of illness, and in February 1535, Ambassador Eustace Chapuis met with Henry to request that Catherine should attend Mary alongside a physician 
because no one would understand Mary the way that her mother did. Henry refused out of fear that Mary would become more obstinate if in the presence of her mother. He particularly believed that if Mary had the comfort of her mother, there would be no hope of bringing her to do what he wanted, to renounce her lawful and true succession. Chapuis then suggested that Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, might attend Mary instead, as Mary regarded her as a second mother. The Countess was Catherine of Aragon's closest English friend and had previously served as governess of Mary's household in Wales. Remaining in that position until 1533, when Mary's household was disbanded so that Mary could live with Elizabeth. Henry denied this also, suggesting that Margaret was a fool. Yet by March, she was added back to Mary's household. However, Henry began to mete out several punishments for those who refused to sign the Oath of Supremacy. In summer of 1535, both John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, and Thomas More, former Lord Chancellor, were both executed for treason after refusing to sign the oath. Chapuis reported that Anne Boleyn is incessantly crying after the king that he does not act with prudence in suffering the queen and princess to live, who deserved death more than all those who have been executed, and that they were the cause of all. Though Chapuis could be prone to exaggeration, this still does not seem like the behavior of a doting stepmother. On 7 January 1536, Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, died. Meanwhile, Anne Boleyn was in the early stages of her second pregnancy. Anne, fearing that Henry's affections for her might decline now that Catherine was dead, reached out to Mary as their reconciliation could be a means of securing favor with Henry. Anne instructed Lady Shelton to tell Mary that if she would lay aside her obstinacy and obey her father, Anne would be the best friend in the world to her, like another mother, and would obtain for her anything she liked to ask, and that if she wished to come to court, Mary would be exempted from holding the tail of her gown. Mary flatly refused, stating that there was no daughter in the world who would be more obedient to her father in what she could do, saving her honor and conscience. On the day of Catherine's burial, Anne went into premature labor and gave birth to a stillborn son. Catherine had perhaps been Anne's greatest protection from Henry becoming disaffected of his second marriage and seeking another partner who could give him a son. As long as Catherine was alive, Henry could not divorce a second time and risk having three living wives. After Catherine's death and Anne's miscarriage, the cracks in Henry and Anne's relationship became wider until Henry realized he would be more satisfied with a new, unopposed third wife. Anne was executed on 19 May 1536, charged with treason. The day before her execution, Anne sent lady-in-waiting, Lady Kingston, to Mary to ask for her forgiveness. She should, wrote 19th century historian John Lingard in A History of England, throw herself in like manner at the feet of Lady Mary and beseech her to forgive the many wrongs which the pride of a thoughtless, unfortunate woman had brought upon her. Just 10 days after Anne's execution, Mary had a second stepmother, Jane Seymour, only seven years Mary's senior. Jane had previously served in Catherine of Aragon's household, knew Mary as a princess, and was devoted to both of them. According to Ambassador Chapuis, Mary even supported Jane as Henry's third wife prior to Anne Boleyn's arrest and downfall. As Jane was affectionate toward Mary, she was willing to be both a friend and stepmother to the princess. After Mary's separation from her own mother and bad treatment under Anne Boleyn, this must have been a welcome change. Jane encouraged a reconciliation of the bitter relationship between Mary and Henry, although Henry refused to return Mary to favor until she signed an oath of succession. Even before Anne's execution, Jane had begged for Mary's restoration, but Henry had resisted, declaring that Jane was a fool and ought to solicit the advancement of the children they would have between them and not any others. Jane, however, 
argued that in asking for the restoration of Mary, she conceived she was seeking the rest and tranquility of the king, herself, her future children, and the whole realm. Even the Empress Isabella, Mary's cousin, heard that Jane was kindly and well disposed to Mary. While the women were in close in age, it seems as though Jane did engage in motherly activities towards Mary. On 22 June 1536, Mary signed a statement agreeing that the marriage of her mother and father was never valid, that she was legally a bastard, and that her father was supreme head of the Church of England. Though surely a cruel blow to the loyalty she held for her mother, the oath meant that Mary could finally regain her own household. Mary and Henry were reunited three weeks later, where Henry showed Mary much love and affection, and Jane gave Mary a diamond ring. To celebrate Mary's obedience, Henry later gave Mary a ring. Upon one side was a relief of Henry and Jane, and the other a picture of Mary. She was now permitted to move freely between the court and her other residences, and her relationship with her father was never seriously threatened again. Seemingly, Mary delighted in the attention of her father, and her health improved. Once father and daughter were reconciled, it is thought that Jane wrote to Mary, though only Mary's response remains. In it, the princess thanks the queen consort for her motherly joy, offers to serve her obediently, and signs the letter as your grace's most humble and obedient daughter and handmaid. Mary spent Christmas 1536 with her father and Jane at Greenwich. During her 17th month tenure as queen, Jane showed kindness to Mary and the two became friends. Upon the eruption of the 1536 Pilgrimage of Grace, an uprising in some of England's northern counties against the Reformation, Henry recalled both Mary and Elizabeth to court, where Jane watched over them. Jane was genuinely happy to see Mary and insisted on dining at the same table as her, with the two women facing each other. Jane even took an interest in meeting with an imperial ambassador to discuss Mary's potential marriage to the brother of the King of Portugal. Jane was allowed to meet with the ambassador and discuss negotiations for the match. Not only did this show Jane's affection for Mary, but the arranging of marriages was one of a queen's main duties for her children. In this way, Jane acted as a traditional queen consort while showing favor to her stepdaughter. Jane informed the ambassador that she would do everything she could to promote the match to Henry. Yet it came to nothing. In May 1537, Jane's pregnancy was announced. Mary became one of the queen's attendants, reciprocating her friendship by sending her quails and cucumbers to satisfy her cravings. After Edward's birth on 12 October, Mary stood as his godmother in the chapel at Hampton Court Palace. Jane died 12 days later, and Mary was too grief-stricken to take part in the initial obsequies. But she gathered her composure and served as Jane's chief mourner, riding behind her coffin from Hampton Court to Windsor. In a final act that would have pleased Jane, Mary was given some of Jane's jewels. Mary's accounts for the period show that she made a number of payments, both as offerings for Jane and as pensions to members of Jane's household. Henry's fourth marriage took place on 6 January 1540 to Anne of Cleves, who was less than one year older than Mary. Both Mary and Elizabeth attended the ceremony in the Chapel Royal at Greenwich. Although the marriage only lasted six months, during that time, Mary and Anne formed a friendship that would last until Anne's death in 1557. In June 1543, Mary visited Anne at Richmond Palace, and in June 1544, Anne sent Mary a gift of Spanish silk. Anne later rode with Elizabeth directly behind Mary upon her entry into London for her coronation in 1533. Nevertheless, only one year later, Mary's counselors suspected Anne of being involved in Wyatt's Rebellion, a Protestant insurrection that broke out under the leadership of Sir Thomas Wyatt. Although nothing came of the accusations, Mary and Anne remained friends 
although Anne never returned to court. Mary did, however, make sure that Anne was buried in Westminster Abbey, befitting her position as both a former queen and beloved sister to the King of England. Mary gained her next stepmother on 28 July 1540, when Henry married Catherine Howard, who was between five and eight years younger than Mary, as estimates on Howard's date of birth vary, and she was a cousin to Anne Boleyn. The relationship between Mary and Catherine was fraught, likely due both to Catherine's age and her ties to Anne. In December 1540, Catherine asked Henry to remove two of Mary's attendants because Mary did not show her the same respect she had given to Catherine's two predecessors. Mary and Catherine evidently reconciled their differences because Mary's maids were allowed to stay. By May of the following year, Henry granted Mary full permission to reside at court and the Queen Catherine has countenanced it with good grace. The two women had little in common besides jewelry and dancing, which was not enough for them to form any kind of friendly, let alone motherly, bond. While Mary's relationship with Catherine was not as directly tense as it had been with Anne Boleyn, Mary's position at court did improve greatly after Catherine's death in 1542, having been found guilty of treason for adultery. Without any wife in the way, Henry was able to enjoy a peaceful relationship with his daughter. By February 1543, Catherine Parr had joined Mary's household. Catherine was only four years older than Mary, and her mother, Maud, was previously a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, who served also as her godmother and namesake. Mary and Catherine may have even known each other as children. Henry began visiting Mary more frequently so as to see Catherine, and the aging king entered into his sixth and final marriage on 12 July, 1543. Both Mary and Elizabeth attended the wedding at Hampton Court. Mary and Catherine's good relationship did not change after Catherine married Henry, although it is unlikely that Mary truly considered her a stepmother in the same way that Elizabeth and Edward did. Ambassador Eustace Chapuis reported that Catherine favors the princess all she can and remarked on how the two women were almost always together. Shortly after Henry and Catherine's wedding, the new queen gave Mary a present of a pair of beautiful gold bracelets set with rubies, emeralds, and diamonds. Catherine also sent her one of her favorite musicians as a messenger to Mary, praising his skill in music in which you, I am well aware, take as much delight as myself. Despite Mary and Catherine's religious differences, the women enjoyed a close relationship and studied together. Catherine even enlisted Mary to translate the Gospel of John for her English language edition of Erasmus's paraphrases on the New Testament. Most likely, Mary and Catherine had a mutual affection for one another and perhaps a sisterly bond. Catherine was certainly a driving force in restoring both Mary and Elizabeth to the line of succession. She was an attentive stepmother for all three of Henry's children, and several letters exist between Catherine, Elizabeth, and Edward, where Elizabeth refers to herself as your most obedient daughter, and Edward notes he is Catherine's loving son. Catherine also oversaw their educations and had their portraits painted. It was on 26 June 1554 that all three royal children came together with their father at Whitehall for a lavish reception that demonstrated the reconciliation of the entire royal family. The moment was captured in the portrait known as the family of Henry VIII. Though the painting features Jane Seymour as Henry's wife, the message was clear that Henry finally had the family he had always desired. Later that year, Henry left Whitehall for France on campaign. Catherine was made Regent of England to rule in Henry's stead. She oversaw council, as well as supplies of men and money for war. The three royal children stayed with Catherine while she governed from Hampton Court Palace, certainly providing a strong influence for Mary and Elizabeth. Henry died on 28 January, 1547. 
Mary stayed with Catherine Parr until April of that year, at which point she journeyed north to her new estates. Thereafter, Catherine rekindled her romance with Thomas Seymour, and the pair secretly married in May. Mary disapproved of her father's widow remarrying so quickly, yet the following year, Mary wrote to her pregnant stepmother, wishing her a safe delivery and trusting to hear, good success of your grace's great belly. Mary signed the letter as your highness's humble and assured loving daughter. Catherine gave birth to a daughter on 30 August 1548 and named the child Mary after her stepdaughter. Yet similarly to Jane Seymour, Catherine died one week later due to childbirth complications. Mary Seymour likely died shortly after her second birthday. No more than eight years younger than all of her stepmothers, with the exception of Anne Boleyn, and a fierce defender of her mother's right as well as her own legitimacy, Mary likely never regarded her father's last five wives as motherly figures. Even when she adopted the daughterly language of deference, she likely did so because it was appropriate protocol rather than a true reflection of her feelings. That said, evidence suggests that Mary did enjoy a close relationship with Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, and Catherine Parr. As a stepdaughter, Mary Shirley not always would have been easy to get on with, but she survived a very uncommon, even dangerous situation. Constant competition with five others to be the most prominent royal woman in England.